All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Irrational Confidence Podcast. We're talking NFL football, and it is draft season. We are here. It is the month of April. All we're talking is we're doing mock drafts. We're going over those college players that we spent, what, four or five months watching them play on the football field. It's time to take their amateur status to the professional level. But the man, my co-host, who's never going to be an amateur, Fresh, Fresh, how you doing, buddy? Perhaps at an amateur hour today. Um, doing great. Love mock draft. This is our second one we've done together. You know, I've done my own individual ones on spinablesports.com. You've got a couple in the works, but now we bring in two more very uh, football savvy, intelligent minds to really get this debate going and drive it home. Yeah. So the funny thing is, fresh happy anniversary because one year ago, this was the very first video we actually had done of a podcast. So, you know, if it's an anniversary, the episode's got to be bigger. It's got to be more intense. It's got to have well more people than me and you. So we're going to bring in our producer, Drew. We talk about him every time on the podcast. We got Drew, and we got our legal eagle. We call him Kinger. Gentlemen, how you doing? Fellas, welcome. Looking to have some Evening, fun. gentlemen. How's it going? Let's go. Just like a producer says, man of very few words. All right. Hey, I, I got the first pick. I'm ready. Uh, <laughs> Jones, <you words. laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, just so you have an understanding how this all works, we divided up all 31 picks. Yes, there's only 31 picks this year. Miami Dolphins forfeited theirs. We've divided up all 31 picks in the first round amongst each other. We have not shared any picks, so this is going to be interesting, especially if someone picks someone as well. And we're going to go through the entire draft, kind of give who we would take if we were the general manager of that franchise. But like our producer Drew said here, he has the number one overall pick. Carolina Panthers making a huge trade to pick up that number one pick, being fleeced by the Bears. Drew, who do you got going number one overall? With the first overall pick, the Carolina Panthers will be selecting quarterback C.J. Stroud. I like it. Drew, Solid selection. Why'd you go with Stroud over the other quarterback? Well, the only other quarterback that really seems like they could have any NFL success, in my opinion, would be Bryce Young. Um, but due to size concerns, I believe Carolina is going to want to go with Stroud. I know Richardson lit up his pro day and is very athletic and everything. But even as incompetent potentially as the Florida coaching staff may have been, I just can't imagine that you're an NFL caliber quarterback and you can't have success with when you have that kind of speed and weapons available to you. So even though I do say the coaches did him no favors, I mean, I didn't watch a ton of Florida games, but at no point did I ever see this guy do anything that made me think, oh, he's going to be a good quarterback at the next level. All I did was watch C.J. Stroud make NFL throws all the time. Yes, to wide open guys, granted, against, you know, terrible defenses. But you could still, I at least saw the throws, you know, happen against defenses and not just on a pro day. We'll see. All right, going to the second pick. The Texans have two picks in the first round. Kinger, you're on the clock for the Houston Texans at number two. Houston Texans. Okay, well, I would go probably with Bryce Young. I would go ahead and take the the second QB there. I would. Um, I think that they need the quarterback in Houston. I would. I think both teams would have preferred to have gotten C.J. Stroud, and I would defer to the Ohio State fans on the uh, recording here. But I've done a little reading on C.J. and I'm fairly impressed with his background. Uh, my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, is that uh, he had quite a difficult upbringing. Uh, my understanding is his dad actually was incarcerated when he was younger. So I think he's going to have uh, a lot more maturity for someone his age coming into the spotlight. Both teams could use it. I think the Texans at two would go for Bryce Young solely because they couldn't get CJ in this context. Um, so, yeah, they need a solid to- quarterback. I think he actually brings, you know, true maturity compared to the previous quarterback they had there and those experiences, this guy gives them something they can actually build around um, and have as a face of the franchise. Yeah, so but as uh, I don't know, I just feel like I got a question. Can the Texans protect you? That's why you have two first round picks. Uh, true. All right, fresh Arizona Cardinals. 
on the clock at number three. <laughs> With the third pick, um, Arizona Cardinals take Will Anderson Jr. Uh, out of Alabama. Uh, edge rusher, defensive, you know, that's a linebacker, could play the edge, could put his hand on the ground if he had to every once in a while. I don't think he will that much, but has that flexibility, can make, make plays all over the field. Fits Coach Gannon's um, defensive strategy there that he had in Philly. That's kind of what he wants. A linebacker can roam and make plays in space and pair him with Isaiah Simmons gives you a lot of speed on the edges. Let me ask you guys to do this. You, it, we watched all this, and quarterbacks definitely get overvalued in a draft. Is Will Anderson the best player in this draft, regardless of quarterback or there? I mean, I know quarterback's the most important position, but is Will Anderson the best player in the draft, in your opinion? I would say yes if I'm ignoring, like, if Jalen Carter had a clean record, I might say him. Carter on the field, still number one, but Will Anderson is a very close second because he just brings explosion plays left and right. He's been doing it for years. And it says a lot um, in a very end part. You go back to the Bryce Young part. The two of them didn't have to play in the Sugar Bowl, and they both showed up for Alabama and played in the Sugar Bowl, and they played until the game was out of hand. So um, it shows their kind of commitment to the team and the franchise and the direction. And I think that's something that you would have to really take into account. All right, so I have the fourth pick, the Indianapolis Colts on the Lock, give a little bit of thought to this one, but they're going to be drafting Will Levis, the quarterback out of Kentucky. I went with Levis over Anthony Richardson because I am a card carrying member of the Anthony Richardson should not be overdrafted fan club. And I won't draft a quarterback who doesn't have at least a 60% completion percentage. I like Levis a lot because I like what I saw when he was there at Kentucky. He's got the size at six foot three. 6'4", depending on what measurement you're looking at. He's got the arm to make all sorts of throws. My only concern with Levis is, and I've told this to multiple people, one of the tapes that I went back and I looked at was the second half of the old Miss game in there where he's down there in Mississippi. He didn't make a bunch of players around him better, but maybe that was just that one tape. Maybe it's just a bad game. That's my only concern with Levis, but I have missed the third quarterback off the board here and the best quarterback remaining between the three, between the him and Richardson. I think the Colts are going to have to go in the direction either way. Um, Levis just scares me because he has, I haven't seen the wild moment in two years there. It was at Kentucky. Um, it just, it kind of worries me. You see the guy in the gym showing off his you know leg muscles and, and chest and arms and shoulders. And you're like, that's great and all, but are you trying to become Tim Tebow and, and become a fullback or a tight end? Or are you actually trying to be a quarterback and be mobile and be able to, you know, there's a lot of differences. I think maybe that's just more of a show thing. It kind of worries me of where the ego is going to be. All right. With the fifth pick, the Seattle Seahawks are on the clock. Drew, who you got for Seattle? Well, I believe uh, the Seattle Seahawks will be taking Jalen Carter at this point. I did just kind of mention he, I felt like he was the best player. Uh, obviously, some off the field stuff, but. I'm also just, based on what I've seen in other mocks, the fact that he's still going where he's going tells me he's very good at football. So Pete Carroll, great guy for him. Seattle, good defensive place. Yeah. He'll be a monster in the middle of that Seahaw the Seahawks defense. And I think being out there with Pete Carroll and getting some of that direction um, might help him. It's gonna be tough, uh, but he if, he if he gets in the field and keeps himself okay, he'll be he'll be dominating for a while. Yeah, let's actually pose this question to our legal eagle here. You, King, you've had some interactions with uh, NFL franchises with guys who do have red flags, similar how Jalen Carter does. Talk to me a little bit about in your legal experience what that what that's like, and do you see these legal issues having a how big of a negative impact would they would have on his draft stock? So it's, I think it's more severe for more middle of the road players uh, as far as stock in the draft itself. Usually um, the way my understanding and the way I've seen it is teams will actually have professionals on board that do extensive background checks and everybody. So it's not just, what you've heard in the media, what's been reported, they actually have teams of people who go out and not just like PR people. Usually it's 
um, retired law enforcement that have been involved in the system for a long time. They will go through whatever the allegations are, investigate it, see what's really there, um, see what kind of noise could be made if one of those players joins your team, um, and then what kind of fallout that might have. And they do a, a really in-depth analysis and breakdown of the cost benefit analysis, you know, do we need this player? Is it worth the possible backlash? Um, and it is, it's a very, very significant uh, factor uh, for the more elite players. It's kind of a, an ironic um, mix because the more elite players usually have had more exposure to their um, bad conduct. So there's already kind of, enough out there that most of the teams are already like you know most people already know what's going on they know the history so it's not as big of a blow where it's ironically more severe is when you have someone who's more middle of the road maybe there was some mentions of a suspension or something at some point in their career um, and then they get drafted and then all of a sudden oh that thing that happened two years ago was actually this and it blows up uh, so in, in this circumstance, I don't think it would be too detrimental, uh, but it's certainly a factor. Uh, I mean, it, it will definitely be looked at because they have to. Awesome. There's just too much money involved and All too right. much potential backlash. Kinger, you are on the clock with the Detroit Lions at number six. Uh, with with the last uh, pick, I'm, I'm forced to switch a little bit here on me, and I'm going to end up going with uh, Tyree Wilson from Texas Tech. Uh, I think that um, – his versatility will add to the defense. I, I know the Lions might have some other um, players and positions they might need people for, but as far as the talent pool and what's available, that would be a dynamic addition to the defense. Uh, and I don't think there's going to be anybody else that they're going to be able to find later in the draft that could fill that position to make them a little bit more complete on the defensive side. Wilson was a stud off the edge for Texas Tech. And I, as we all know, Lions need people to play defense other than Aiden Hutchinson. Yeah, it's interesting because you've had uh, exactly. the Lions My last boy year and this year, <laughs> and both times with the Lions first pick, taking a defensive end. Yeah. All right, Fresh, the Raiders. Got to play the D. Number seven. <laughs> well, Vegas is a great town. The Raiders are great. Um, in an image perspective, uh, not from a team playing perspective. Jimmy G is now the quarterback. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of things they can do in this franchise, a lot of directions they can go. But there's one thing that they definitely need. Um, is some defensive back help. And I think they, they land that in Devin Witherspoon out of Illinois. Um, they've had a lot of busts in the past on first-round picks, uh, well-documented, so they better hope they hit it. But I think Devin Witherspoon is a great corner, will help them against the Broncos, Chiefs, Chargers, and other teams in the AFC in their passing attacks. Fresh, let me, let me ask you this question. Why would you go with Witherspoon over uh, a more of maybe a name brand like Joey Porter Jr. or a guy that – a lot of people are very, very high and out of Oregon and Christian Gonzalez. I've debated all three, um, and they all have. I, I think you really can't go wrong with any of them. I think Porter's a little too handsy, but he does have that namesake, and I think his dad bringing him up and coaching him um, will definitely help. Uh, his experience in the Big Ten, but also Witherspoon in the Big Ten, both have had those matchups, which helps to develop them as well. Um, Gonzalez, um, I think, is my, he's my third corner out of the three. Didn't really have – the, 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 the tremendous amount of experience in the Pac-12, so you're still dealing with athletic ability and not truly as much game film. Um, had some moments in that Washington game last year against Penix Jr. where he might have struggled and got beat a little bit. It's the one thing that worries me, but he's definitely head and shoulders rest above the rest of the crew. But Witherspoon has just shown in the past two years to be a lockdown corner, uh, be able to be a little more technique-wise uh, uh, polished, and I think he'll, um, he'll do great things for the Raiders. All right, well, I am on the clock at number eight with the Atlanta Falcons, and they're going to stay very close to home, not too far from Clemson. I have them taking the defensive end, Miles Murphy. I think Clemson, I think Clemson, him, we always want a little bit more out of him all year long. Uh, we kind of wanted a little bit more production, but he definitely hits all of the boxes when it comes to a defensive end. I think he'd be a great fit in Atlanta. Atlanta could have gone a couple of ways here. I don't see them taking a shot at a quarterback right there at eight. They don't really need a wide receiver or anything like that. So maybe a running back at Bajon Robinson. But I opted to go on the defensive side of the ball, and I went Miles Murphy. Um, 
Murphy's a solid end, can play, also play stand up a little bit on the edge. I do have a question here because I just took a corner. Their secondary outside of AJ Terrell is pretty barren. Um, what forced you to take the defensive, you know, front seven player over a, a player in the secondary? It, it's the whole adage, Fresh. You know, you you work from the quarterback out, and that's the whole idea. Like first thing is you take a quarterback. There's no quarterback that I want on the thing, so that puts me down to two options. Either the guy that's going to protect the quarterback or the guy who's going to go after the quarterback. Since I wanted to go on to the defensive side of the ball instead of the offensive, I went at the guy who went against the quarterback. If if one if Murphy was off the table and the other option I had was Wilson, so if like let's say Wilson and Murphy were off, I was actually going to start looking at Joey Porter Jr., Christian Gonzalez, and Witherspoon as well. I was in that realm looking at those players. But because Murphy was there available, I opted to go against going after the quarterback. Solid analysis. I like it. I just think that that defense can go anywhere. When you look at that depth chart, um, out, it's, it's pretty pretty rough. So they could probably go anywhere they want just to improve that team. Is that? Yeah. All right. With the number nine pick, the man who fleeced himself as the Panthers, the Chicago Bears. Drew, who you got going with for the Bears? Well, to piggyback a little bit on some of the stuff you just said, obviously protecting the quarterback is huge, and they seem to be making a full investment into Justin Fields. And with that in mind, I believe offensive line is going to be key. And so the Chicago Bears will be selecting Peter Skaronsky from Northwestern, um, if I'm pick. saying that correctly. Uh, and I will mention, uh, since you had kind of, uh, we were just talking about Christian Gonzalez as well, Corner is also a need for the Bears, uh, but just looking at the two, I would say like Gonzalez is rated ahead on a lot of boards, but I think a lot of that is positional. I think if you just broke it down like relative to their position, Skaronsky stood out more than Gonzalez, and so I just think you're getting more of a sure thing. And again, protecting Justin Fields should be their number one goal at this point. So going O line. I'm a, Bears. Huge, I'm a huge Skaransky Skor- fan. I love him on Northwestern. Northwestern was terrible. Like, absolutely the drizzling crap this past two years. Like, they could not do anything right. And if you think about it, Skaransky didn't allow a single quarterback pressure. He didn't allow a sack, didn't allow a hit, didn't allow a pressure. If you go back, and the one of the most interesting things that I found about Skaransky was that you go back to the Michigan game in 21, and Aiden Hutchinson destroys Northwestern. But he did it every single time lined up away from Skoransky. I thought that was really interesting. When you also kind of think the Bears itself, it's time for them to change the tables of their entire franchise. We all know the Bears for the 85 defense, you know, the, the 4-6 defense, the linebackers, defensive linemen, Peanuts Hillman in the secondary. We rarely talk about the Bears offense. The Bears offense is all, you know what, if you can get us 13 points, you know, be cute, run the ball, the defense will take care of us. It's time they change that and they build around them. You get a tackle to block for fields. They already got some receivers for them. They build the offense and actually try to be explosive on, and, and change the narrative of that franchise. Might actually get them back to their winning ways. All right, the Philadelphia Eagles making the Super Bowl and have the 10th pick in the draft. King, you're on the clock with the Eagles. Well, this is back-to-back times. Drew has kind of stolen my thunder here uh, because I think with the Eagles and uh, Isaac Samalo walking as far as the free agency, I think he's uh, actually now signed. Um, he, he, who did he go to? He went uh, to the Steelers. Uh, yeah, Steelers. Steelers, right? I believe so. I believe he did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with that, it's kind of a three way for me. And I end I'm gonna end up going with Paris Johnson Jr. from Ohio State at out on offensive line. The reason I'm going with him is uh he has experience, I think, both at uh, tackle and guard on the offensive line. And that's gonna leave a huge hole for the Eagles with Isaac leaving. Um that's something they're gonna need somebody who can step in and play. And if with, with Paris Johnson having experience at both the guard and the tackle position, he'll be more versatile. He's got plenty of experience. I think he'd be able to step in and actually make a contributing difference in year one, which they'll need if they want to keep that 
machine running in Philadelphia. So Paris Johnson Jr., Ohio State, as much True, as Drew, I'm going to actually toss me. this back to you because I think there's three really good offensive linemen at the top half of the drafts, Garansky, Johnson, and Jones out of Georgia. What, what was the difference for you between those three when you were looking at someone on the offensive line? I test. I test. And now, again, full disclosure, not watching a ton of Northwestern and maybe highlight tapes isn't necessarily the best way to go. But just in terms of when you watch it and similar, you mentioned the matchups with Hutchinson and it just anytime he's matched up against the, the best defender, he still doesn't give up any pressures or sacks. Versus, so it's, you know, with some tackle stuff, I, I would just imagine I haven't, you know, gone too deep into the data on offensive line stats, but I would imagine, you know, things could be not so reliable from a data standpoint because there's so many variables about, well, who'd you actually go up against, you know, each game and all that sort of stuff. And I just think size, explosiveness, and the guy performs. I mean, check the tape, check the stats, whatever you need to. Check back in 10 years when he's getting in the Hall of Fame or, you know, at least has that Hall of Fame career going. I like it. All right, Fresh, we're going to you. The Tennessee Titans at number 11. In my opinion, I think this is where the draft truly begins. Um, the Titans have more holes than Swiss cheese. Yeah. Team is pretty rough. And you had to start, you know, Josh Dobbs in your, your week 18 matchup with the division on the line <laughs> go to the playoffs. Uh, you didn't even start Malik Willis. Tannehill, you've had questions on. I'm, I'm extremely tempted here with a brand new GM in there. You know, things can go a lot, a much more different from the Derrick Henry power offense and mentality. Um, I don't know if the GM is truly confident. I don't think I'm confident in taking Anthony uh, Richardson here. I think I'm going to try to continue to build this offense and replace Taylor LeJuan and try to solidify the offensive line, give your Derrick Henry years a little bit more, um, and draft Broderick Jones out of Georgia. I don't think they're bold enough to make a, a true quarterback change yet. I'm not either. I think that Broderick Jones is the quarterback here. Solidify the left tackle, replace LeJuan, and sort of keep that timetable of rugged you know, offense, you know, run the football um, alive for at least a couple more years. Wow. Yeah. I did not expect to run on tackles like that. Well, I'm going to actually pose the same question that I just posed to you, Drew, to the Kinger here. You know, Saransky's off the board. Paris Johnson, it came down to Paris Johnson and Broderick Jones. What, what was the difference maker for you between those two? So, and that's kind of, uh, that's a tough one. And really the deciding factor was with Paris having some experience at guard and tackle. Uh, I think he's a little bit more versatile. And the other thing is, uh, and this isn't a dig at Georgia. I have tons of respect for Georgia. I went there for a couple of years. I'm, I'm a quasi fan, so to speak. But um, I think that the talent pool at Georgia is so loaded and was for the, for the past couple of years that um, it, it was easier to have off games and not have it show. Uh, I'm not saying that's necessarily anything that happened with Broderick Jones per se, but Paris Johnson stood out a little bit more to me. Uh, and to be fair, I have watched the Big Ten more religiously. So I've seen more games with them. I've paid more attention to them. So it might just be my perspective. But ultimately, deciding factor, more versatility and being able to step in right off from jump uh, for the Eagles. All right, we're swinging back. You get your second pick, Ryan, for the Houston Texans at number 12. Who are you taking to pair with Bryce Young? Ooh, let's see here. Um, I think I'm going to have to go with uh, another Ohio State person. It pains me as much as I do it, but I'm going to have to say uh, Jackson Jigba. I'm going to have to throw a wide receiver in there on him. Uh, I think that having that kind of explosive uh, new talent coming in from both of them would be uh, not to use the word too much, but explosive. I mean, uh, Jigma is an impressive addition to anybody. And I think he's got NFL level quality talent. That's going to surprise people who've even been watching him in college. And it really hurts to say that because he is from Ohio state, but the guy's incredible. And I think he's going to do great things. So you put those two together. Hands I think down, correct. Best receiver in the draft, him and Bryce. Um, 
you give them some time, they'll they'll be a nice little combination, kind of like a Andre Johnson was there, and then uh, you know um, uh, the the the, the, most, the previous quarterback we'll call him and uh and and Hopkins and their combination. So this will be another another future for Houston. All right, so I'm going to pose this question to the group. Now, like Drew said, we had a run on tackles there at 9, 10, and 11. Argument here, if you guys were the GMs, uh, and let's say one of those three tackles were available to the Texans at, at three, would you rather pair a tackle with Bryce Young or would you rather give him a weapon on the outside? I'll let you guys go first. I, I, I wanted the weapon. I mean, that's why I picked him. I mean, even in your hypothetical. Um, I think that, and maybe I'm being too greedy. I don't know. Maybe this is me being an eighth grader playing Madden and just wanting to see that fly ball go downfield. But um, I think that that's a lot of firepower that you can get back to back in the same year. And you could build something like Fresh was talking about. You have those two work together for a couple of years with that kind of talent. We keep them together. That could be dynamite. Yeah, I agree. Um, I would go playmaker there as well. I don't know, you know, their full offensive line situation, but one thing I do know is their best receiver got traded, and I think their second best receiver might be a free agent now if he's even healthy. So I don't know who Bryce Young would be throwing to if they don't get a receiver. Yeah, I mean, you look at Laramie Tunsil is already getting tap left tackle money. You don't want to have too much money built up in your two tackles. Um, you have some, you know, younger receivers trying to get, you know, in the mix, mix of things, but Jackson Smith and Jig was number one. You know, if John Mechie comes back from his cancer and recovers from that, 100% healthy, you get a guy who can slide in the slot, you start building some weapons there. Um, and that's, I think, with the mobility that Bryce Young does offer, it kind of limits the need to having two tackles if you already have one locked in the left and going the receiver's the best choice. All right. All right. So I am on the clock at number 13 with the New York Jets. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to take another trend here. With the 13th pick, the New York Jets are going to attract Brian Breesey out of Clemson, six foot five, 300 pound defensive tackle. I think that the, with the Jets, I'm shoring up that defense. I'm going to try to stop the run even better for them. I kind of was hoping one of the ends would fall to me at at 13. I was a little disappointed when they didn't. I was wondering, you know, who would who would kind of be there. I was between maybe picking up some O-line help. I think this is where one of the players that was taken early on in the draft, I really, if I'm the Jets, I'm hoping one of those guys is sitting there looking at me at 13. They're not. I'm going to go Brian Brisey. Wow. Seth, is your – your hatred for Clemson as an Ohio State fan just bubbling over here. You taking two Clemson players or two picks? I still want to punch Dabo Sweeney in the face. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, I don't dislike. Remember, I don't dislike Clemson as much as I hate. That, Gus yeah, that's true. That's, well, that's true. That's if you true. take a UCF player, we're gonna have issues. On in the same location at once. Seth would go into overload. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. All right. We could spend all time on, on, never mind. All right, we're going to the 14th pick here. We're going to go to the New England Patriots. You know, Drew, this pick is yours here. Is it a running back or is it not a running back? Not a running back, sure. Sure. We're on to Anthony Richardson. Oh. No! Oh. Oh. Love it. All right. So Matt, where's Mac Jones getting traded to? That's the real question. Well, I don't know. I'm sitting the, back and letting justify this one. I don't know the validity of it, but I did see multiple sources reporting that Mac Jones is being shopped. And so if a quarterback does fall to the Patriots at 14, now I will say full disclosure, I think some team is going to reach before this could potentially happen, but you never know because even in ours, we have, what, three quarterbacks going ahead of him. So fourth quarterback could make it down to 14. And I just think it would be hilarious whether it works out or not, because I feel like there's going to be such a, a divide between 
oh, this is the perfect fit. Like Bill Belichick finally has the weapon he's always wanted. Like people ignore that Tom Brady did all that, you know, for all those years. It's like, oh, give Bill a weapon and watch what he can do. And then there's going to be the other half of people that go, like, this is going to be a huge bust. And it's just another bad decision by Bill, like hiring his family and all his defensive buddies to coach offense and ruin Mac Jones' career. But I don't think Mac Jones had much of a career uh, anyway. Other than looking like Tom Brady in the combine photo, he was no Tom Brady. So, uh, yeah, Anthony Richardson. And what do you guys think here? Now, I know, Seth, I know you have, you know, you're, you hate the guy. No, I hate the guy. You just hate the idea of drafting the guy. But I'm, and maybe I'm breaking the own rules of our draft because we're supposed to, like, embody these GMs and do what we think they would do. And I guess I'm sort of doing that. Like, I just think if he's there at the Patriots pick and they don't have to trade up, I wouldn't be shocked if they do it. Yeah. I mean, we can't make a hypothetical trade to back trade down like the Patriots usually do. There is quarterback issues. Bill was mad that Mac was calling, you know, Alabama, you know, coaches and trying to discuss the offensive problems he's having with the Patriots. And there's also kind of a theory to it. And a lot of people in New England have the thought of, Bill Belichick's not happy with Tom with uh, with, with you know Kraft and is trying to sabotage the franchise. Um, and there's also the rumors of he started to get mad because people think that it's all Tom Brady. It wasn't Bill Belichick, which there's a valid argument for that because he didn't win much before Tom took the field and he hasn't won much after. He's had two losing seasons in the past three years, so maybe he is. You're like you know what? I'm gonna do whatever the heck I want to do. And Anthony Rich is there, but let him run around with Bill O'Brien, and we're going to just have fun. Um, you're not winning now, and honestly, you are the fourth team in the AFC East for the first time in a long time. You've got to be bold and make a play. <laughs> yep. Um, and quarterbacks are overvalued in every draft. True. The th- again, Anthony Richardson, it's not that I dislike the person. I, what, the problem is that I have with my issue with drafting him high is that I believe we're setting him up for failure. And and that's what a GM was doing. Because while I do believe that like talent is there, I think he's one of he is in in this day and age you don't sit and hold a clipboard. You don't sit for a year like um some of these other quarterbacks back in the day used to do. You had, it's here now instant gratification on drip when you draft a quarterback. If if the Patriots were to Play, keep Mac Jones, play him for a year, and have Richardson sitting behind Jones. I'm, I'd be okay with that. Then I would be okay with in that scenario right there. If you're trading Mac Jones to expect Anthony Richardson to start, nah, I, I just don't. I don't like the idea. I because I think that the the weight is put too much on him. And then what? What are we going to do? We're going to call the dude a bust, not because. He's not good. It's because we draft him too high, and so we place unreasonable expectations on him. That's well, I think my you take issue. the approach of like the Jordan Love, Aaron Rodgers both sat. There's a bunch of quarterbacks who sat, but that fifth year option for first round picks makes the quarterbacks more intriguing. And that's another reason to your point about sitting and learning. They could take him here. He's, a, he's a, if he's the best player on the board, they take him. They let him sit for a year or two. If he actually truly is better than Mac Jones, they cut bait from Jones. Don't give him the fifth year option and move on with Richardson because right now. I'm correct, 21-22. This is the 23 season. They don't have to pick up the fifth-year option on Mac Jones until after this year, next like a year from now over that. So this could basically be the last year for Mac Jones. And at that point, you cut bait and you're out in four years. He's gone and you have somebody yeah, but, else to replace him. Yeah. I'd feel much better if Richardson was at the 22-23 Ravens-Vikings area, but that's me. Yeah, I was just going to say with with AR, uh, I don't know if he's coachable. I don't know if he can. And I'm not an expert on him by any stretch. And I'm not a big fan of UF. So all that, you know, taken into consideration. But I think he's one of these guys who's got an incredible amount of natural talent. He's an he's a God given athlete. But when we watched him play, he didn't progress. If anything, he kind of backtracked. As he went on, there wasn't any major improvement. That's a huge concern for me. Um, he his his completions were atrocious for somebody in that kind of a position. And I know he's an athlete. Maybe they can. Maybe he'll turn it all around. Maybe he will be that kind of like a unicorn coming out of it. Um, but it, it will be an all or nothing for him. I think he will show up and do great things, or we will not hear much of him 
in a couple of years. We'll see. I can spend a lot of time on my thoughts on Aaron <laughs> Rodgers or Anthony Richardson. All right. Let's keep going. 15th pick in the draft. It's the Green Bay Packers. A lot of drama out there in Green Bay. When are they going to trade Rodgers? But you know what? I'm going to be petty as all get out if I am Green Bay. I'm trading Rodgers, and I'm drafting a weapon. I am taking Michael Mayer, the tight end, out of Notre Dame. I think he's the best tight end in this draft there. Six foot five, big time target. Wound up having just over 800 yards and nine touchdowns this past year with really crappy quarterback play there at Notre Dame. I like Mayer, great weapon for Jordan Love, and I think that it'd be another way for uh, Green Bay to kind of give Aaron Rodgers the bird on the way out because he's always begged for a weapon. That's them being petty. Well, I think it's, it would be even more comical if they uh, traded yeah. up and took a receiver. Um, you know, that, that, would, doing that would be the biggest one. But I thought about it. You know, I think with Tanyan gone, Mercedes Lewis leaving, following uh, Aaron Rodgers over to New York. Uh, Mike Meyer um, fits the, the tight end needs, offensive weapon. They run a lot. They want to run a lot of play action off of it anyway, and that kind of fits the offense of run blocking, play action, tight end in the middle of the field, um, a lot of cross, a crossing action. It, just, it, it seems like a perfect fit. And you could, honestly, between him or Kincaid um, or, you know, Darrell Dar- Dar- Washington, all of them sort of fit the same mold of what Green Bay is trying to do offensively. And again, just for the pettiness. <laughs> Come on. All right, Fresh. You're you're the commanders. You're on the clock at number 16. Who you have the Washington Commanders taken? Well, the commanders front seven, actually the defensive line especially, is very talented. Um, well documented there. The offense is actually kind of interesting. As Sam Howell, quarterback, they've committed to him. They have some receiver depth. They have some running backs. Um, but the one thing they really don't have is, is secondary help. Um and with that, we're going to fix that knee. We're going to take Joey Porter Jr. and we're going to put him back there in the secondary and uh, let him sort of lock down the wide receivers of the NFC East and the NFC in general. Well, as the GM of the team picking next, thank you for leaving Christian Gonzalez on the board. That will be who the Pittsburgh Steelers are taking with the 17th overall pick. Sorry to jump. Well, I did ahead. that as a courtesy. Appreciate you. I didn't want Joey Porter Jr. to play in his own dad's stadium and have <laughs> to deal with that or those connections. Let's put him in a different spot. Doesn't have to worry about that connection and uh, build his own legacy. That would be t- like so. If if Porter Jr. is on the board for the Steelers at seventeen, do they have to take him? I say, hey, they took Kenny Pickett. Yeah, I, I think I think you kind of have to. <laughs> Kenny Pickett. Ah. All right, let's keep on rolling here. We're coming back. The Detroit Lions have their second pick in the first round. Ryan, you had the Lions taking Tyree Wilson out of Texas Tech. Who you got them taking with this their second pick? So I'm flipping over on this one, um, and I've gone back and forth a couple times while I've been sitting here, and I think I'm going to have to go with Quentin Johnston, wide receiver. TCU. Um, I think that Detroit needs some more weapons uh, on the offensive side of the ball as well. He's a solid pick. Um, I'm not by any means an expert uh, on him, but looking at his stats and seeing what he could add, I think that might be the best play uh, for someone to try to make some make some bigger plays on the other side of the ball to kind of balance out the Lions. If, if that's the case, that offense is going to be ridiculous. You got DeAndre Swift, and then you have Jamison Williams, Amon St. Brown, and Quentin Johnson, a wide receiver. Uh, J- Jared Goff could throw for six, for 6,000 yards and 40 touchdowns if he just doesn't mess it up his own. <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> All right. We're going to fresh. Tom Brady's retired in Tampa, and they're on the clock at 19. Who you got the Bucks taking fresh? Well, I think you still have the veterans on offense. But this team's getting older. I don't think they're they're going to struggle to win under Baker or Kyle Trask. I think you have to really look at what what they can do best is build that defense and maintain that defense. Uh, they have two decent corners. They have Antonio Winfield Jr. at one of the safety spots, but they've got to find the next person in the backfield. The best, the next best defensive player we got on the board from the secondary position 
is Brian Branch at Alabama. He can play the nickel spot. He can play the other safety role. I think he's a perfect fit there in that Buccaneer defense. Um, it keeps them in, in, in competitive mode um, for a long period of time, but still keeping the defense intact and improving on it and giving them a chance to make the playoffs and build even without a true number one quarterback. It's tough because I, it's kind of weird for first time ever. Like Brian Branch isn't like a huge name, especially coming out of a place like Alabama. He kind of was quietly under the radar. Um, you know, you Good had player. Jordan Battle, you know, all the different corners there, you know, Kool Aid and, and Eli Rex, and, you know, Henry T. Otoa, uh, Toa Toa, a linebacker, and Will Anderson. It's kind of, they, they take all the big hype. He's the guy in there and doing all the things in between the field that's sort of just under the radar, but the talent is there. And you can watch film. You see, start seeing him pop more and more um, without getting the name recognition on a consistent basis. Absolutely. All right. The Seahawks are on the clock for the second time. Drew, you're the GM of the Seahawks. You took Jalen Carter with the first pick. Who are you taking at number 20? You're muted. Well, if I was going on my board, my best player available would be Elijah Cansey. But since I already took an interior defensive lineman, uh, I don't want to double up on that. And the Seahawks definitely need some interior O-line help. I will be going to the Florida Gators offensive guard Osiris Torrance. Great pick. Great pick. Solid presence. Can play both guards. Um, Kid kid flashed up uh, Louisiana beforehand under Napier and then went to Florida and sort of took it to the next level. He... He's a special talent, and he has this, he has the right mindset to to be a road grader there in the middle of the field. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to pick up pull up his measurables real quick. Six foot five, three forty five, and it, he's huge for a guard. That you dude, could even play him a tackle. I think they probably work him out there. They could even maybe get some tackle use out of him as a yeah. swing as a swing tackle in in, a, in an emergency situation. Yeah, and I think like if if Seahawks fans saw this like from from jump, and they'd be like, it's not a sexy draft. But it would be like, this would be a type of, if they picked up both of these players, like possibly, arguably, the two, two of the best players at their respective position, this would be one of those drafts that you look back on and go, man, this, is, this would be a great thing for the Seahawks. Definitely. And it, Definitely. I wouldn't word it in the way of saying like that they're two like, safe picks, but in a sense they are because they're both such complete players that it would be hard to imagine either of them not having success at the next level. So I'm on the clock with the Sandy or well, no longer San Diego. I almost did that Los Angeles chargers. Listen, I love San Diego fair place, but with the, with the LA chargers with the 21st pick, I am taking and this might be a little controversial because they have a running back there, but I'm taking Bajan Robinson here. I am just kind of floored that Robinson is – I have him as a top 10 talent. I, his stats are comparable to Ezekiel Elliott and Saquon Barkley. Catch, can catch the ball out of the backfield. He's elusive. He, he can run with some power. He can run with speed. He's got some wiggle. He had a huge share of the offense there in Texas. when. You see what he was able to do, even when Quinn Ewers went down. This allowed, you know, I know Austin, they have Austin Eckler. And Austin Eckler is great for fantasy purposes. But Bajan Robinson is the type of running back that the Chargers could really use. I'm looking at this as the next coming of LaDainian Tomlinson. I love Bajan Robinson in this draft. The more and more I look at him, I'll admit, I was, when I'm wrong, I called Bajan Robinson overrated going into previous season he did everything to prove me wrong my bad Bajan if you hear this I apologize I have a lot of respect for you and I think it's a crime that I'm having to draft you at 21 but the LA Chargers are going to get a damn good running back in you well I mean the 17 game schedule you need multiple running backs because injuries are going to happen um so having two stud running backs that can rotate in and out almost interchangeable really helps the offense flow and also is Austin Eckler asking for a trade um, and the team granting him a chance to go out and try to search, search a trade, you get yourself to replace it immediately. That makes the trade even a little easier. You sort of settle for that and move on, or you play both of them and let his contract run out. But it's you got to take talent when talent's on the board. Yeah. 
how do how do both of you guys feel about drafting a running back in the first round? I know this has kind of become a weird adage, and still happens to this day. It's not something that doesn't happen anymore at all. It's not completely crazy. But what do you think when a GM drafts a running back in the first round? I think it's situational, um, but so I wouldn't do it if I don't already have a quarterback on a rookie deal. Um, and then depending on, you know, like someone like a Barkley, more versatile pass game, run game kind of can be a weapon all over the field. I would be more comfortable doing it. Maybe Robinson can become that. But I just I guess to then summarize, I probably wouldn't do it because. I just, I don't know. What was the last one that really paid off? Saquon, Christian McCaffrey, but they've also had injury concerns every once in a while. You yeah. know, you're, it's a lot more wear and tear for running backs. They're getting, they, they've been running the ball since, you know, peewee football. And that wear and tear in the body eventually catches up with you. And you've got to maintain a, a, a great health and, and keep yourself fresh. Kinger, what's your thoughts? I think it's, uh, I mean, similar statement. I think it's kind of when the glove fits, not to go full OJ on you. But uh, I think if you've got a situation where you've got a running back that, you know, fits your offense as it's already kind of set up, then it, it it's smart. It's a move that makes sense. But it's not one of those things where I think you'd want to tailor your offense specifically around a first-year running back. I think that's really dangerous unless you have like a, a once-in-a-century talent. Uh, like Corum, perhaps, you know, someone like that, maybe. But otherwise, I'd say it's, it's a stretch you don't want to really make if you don't have to. All right, we're going to the 22nd pick in the draft. It is the Baltimore Ravens. They got some quarterback questions over there. But, Kinger, who do you got the Ravens taking at 22? It's a tough call. I know they do have some quarterback issues, um, and I'm not – not really sure. I've kind of gone back and forth on this. I've got a couple different people in mind. Um, and this is kind of a stretch out there, but I would go out and I would probably go for uh, Hendon Hooker. I've gone back and forth on him. I know he's got some injury issues. I know there's a lot of question marks there, but with what's left in their um, possibilities, you know, he... He was fun to watch, and he had something that not a lot of players do uh, in his position because he had already kind of had the uh, needed to come back and fight from behind and win uh, mentality, and that was fun to see, and I think he's already proven he can do that. So pending uh, you know, unforeseen things not coming out, that could be one of those unicorn situations where he really is you know fantastic even if for a couple of years. Big question mark, dangerous play, could pay off. Wow. It's a, it's a bold pick, and I think that right there would send a clear message to a uh, current quarterback that his days in Baltimore are numbered. Um, I'm not going to lie. I will say this right now. I had the next pick with the Vikings, and if it wasn't you, Henning Hooker would be a Minnesota Viking for the only reason is that Kirk Cousins wow. is on the last year of his contract, and he would have been a free agent at $40 million. You don't want to pay Kirk Cousins $40 million. <laughs> You give yourself a, uh, five years to chill out and pay a hen and hooker. It's, you have to make a decision. And I think that's what the, the Ravens right now are doing the same thing. Of, is Lamar worth the money at a fully guaranteed rate? They want to pay him money. It's not fully guaranteed. Well, the biggest knock with Hooker is that he's 25 years old going into the year. Yeah. And he's going to have to sit out a year to recover fully from that ACL injury. What he, he tore his ACL began in November, right? If I remember yep. correctly. Yeah. Um, third third week in November. Third week in November. Okay, so, you know, let's say he, first time he's going to be back, he's going to start on the pup list for sure. Um, I'm looking, you'd be looking at maybe a late September, early October return if he has a great rehab and kind of like superhuman rehab on that one. Um, but again, if you could sit, if, you know, if you could let, him sit again. It, I I actually like him. I think he's not the athletic talent that Anthony Richardson is, but I think mentally in between the ears, he's yeah. a better he's a better quarterback. He's got, he's got a just quarterback good arm. Mm -hmm. Yep, totally. He, and he's got that spark. He's got um, 
uh, I don't know what, what you'd want to call it, but uh, he's got a, a factor that isn't necessarily measured in, in distance and speed and completions. Uh, and I know that's a little cheesy, but I think he really does have something to him that if he can come back, whoo, he could be impressive. Yeah. Yep. And especially if you could then get the two picks for Lamar going forward, you get if you let him sit for this year and then going into the 24 draft, you could use those picks, put some weapons, start putting weapons around him. So, all right, Fresh, let's move to you at 23, the Minnesota Vikings. Well, I mean, this team, I'm going to say, I think their window is – is coming somewhere, somewhere, somewhere to close. We just mentioned about the Kirk Cousins and him being a free agent at the end of the year. Nobody on the roster right now from a quarterback perspective that can fill up. They're going to have to pay Jordan Jefferson here real soon. Um, Dalvin Cook is rumored to be on the trading block, potentially be shipped out. Um, defense is horrible. Uh, where where does this franchise turn? You know, you have a new head coach, you have a new GM who aren't connected to Kirk Cousins, didn't really take care of many of the players that are current on the roster. They came in last year, so um, you can go in multiple ways. Looking at the draft board, looking at what we have, sometimes you have to sort of look a little bit toward need and away from the best player available. Uh, Jordan Addison sitting there in the face, but do you really want to have two receivers on there with no quarterback? I uh, have to pay a lot of them. Um, they have no defensive backs, and I think that's where you guys are stopping people. And the way you know you mentioned uh, the Lions taking Quentin Johnson, I already have Jamison Williams. You got to find ways to defend somebody, and I think the Vikings will end up settling um, and taking Deontay Banks, cornerback from Maryland. Uh, got to find somebody to start stopping somebody in the air, and they need to help solidify the defense in one way, and you got to start the secondary. I like it. All right, Drew, let's go to you and the hometown Jacksonville Jaguars. We're out of Jacksonville, Florida. So we got the Jaguars had a nice run through the playoff. Who do you have them <laughs> adding there at 24? Well, I'm between a few players here, and – so the Jaguars could use a little bit of help on both sides of the ball. And this is going to be one of those, I am totally going to use a bit of conference bias. Um, so full disclosure, Jaguars are between Lucas Van Ness and Nolan Smith. Uh, Lucas Van Ness, Ed Rusher out of Iowa. Nolan Smith, Ed Rusher out of Georgia. And I will be drafting the SEC over the Big Ten, uh, despite my love for the Big Ten, I just think that I even see Van Ness is, you know, ranked not significantly better, but is like sig- noticeably often being taken ahead in mocks, ranked ahead roughly three to five, you know, overall, depending on which way you're looking at it. But I just think at the end of the day, Nolan Smith will have a better pro career. And that is why Jacksonville Jaguars will be drafting Nolan Smith. That's Smith there with Walker on the edges, two dogs. Interesting for that Jaguar defense. Campbell in the back, the bat in the secondary. That's, I mean, the offense is loaded, but that defense, they can just find a way to keep getting better. The team, the division's theirs if they keep playing better. Now you start focusing on competing with the Bills, the Bengals, the Chiefs, um, and thinking long term and defensively of stopping those uh, great offenses. Yeah. I, I like the Nolan Smith pick. I had I actually had Nolan Smith on uh, my list here for what I was starting to look at for the Giants here at 25. He was one of three players that I kind of had my the earmarked on here. I like the speed of him because it, that's the one thing that really jumps off the film because we wound up watching more Georgia games and, and seeing some other stuff on them. Nolan Smith, he's got that – really high-end speed that can go sideline to sideline at the linebacker position, you need someone to fly around like him. You need someone who can get to the football, make a play. Is he, is he the best defensive player in this draft? No. But is he a guy that's going to constantly contribute for him? Yeah. I like, I like him for the Jaguars a lot. I agree. And one thing to, um, Van Ness, just the last thing, is Kitts never started a game in his career. Um, it just makes me very, you know, trust, like, why was the kid not starting? All right. So the New York football giants at 25, giving Daniel Jones a huge contract. They got Saquon. I need to add some more offense to the Giants. They are going to be taking Jordan Addison out of USC. 
Jordan Addison, again, last year comes out of the draft. He's He would have been in the conversation with Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, Jamison Williams, all of those wide receivers that were that top-tier talent there. J- Jordan Addison was ridiculous with Kenny Pickett as quarterback at Pitt. Caleb Williams in that offense at USC where he was spreading the ball all over the place and winning a Heisman at it. Addison is just a phenomenal wide receiver. Is he going to be the fastest wide receiver in this draft? No. Is he the biggest? Does he have Quentin Johnson size? No. Is he the strongest? No. But the dude gets open. He gets open, and that's what matters. He winds up making the catch when it matters the most. I love Jordan Addison. Um, I have him as my my third wide receiver behind JSN and uh, Quentin Johnson. And I really think that the Giants are getting a really good addition this late in the draft. Agreed. And Brian Dable will find ways to get into football. Absolutely. All right. The pick that everyone would debate more than anyone else and the national media is going to cover more than anything in the world with the 26th overall pick, the Dallas Cowboys. Drew, who are you Stephen A. Smith. <laughs> The Dallas Cowboys, I believe, would be very, very happy if this guy was actually available to them at 26, and that would be defensive lineman Elijah Cancer. Ooh, the pick kid. I yes. Honestly, he has the same kind of frame as Aaron Donald, went to the same school, has been mentored by him. I, I have this kid very high in my top 105. You can see all of them on, on cinemasports.com. I think he's going to be a monster and continue to develop, and the Cowboys will get a nice big steal here. Yeah, this kid, I, I'm kind of curious why he's not getting more love for what he for where he is. Like I've seen a lot of places go, have him anywhere from, like, down at the bottom of of there, maybe like a, a second round pick. I've seen him up in the top fifteen. I like Clancy a lot. Fresh and correct me if I'm wrong. Did he? He made our post All American team, did he not? He did, and we we've watched him at Pitt for a few years now, and he just continued to get better and better and better. And this past year, finished strong um, down the stretch. Really kept that Pitt defense alive. Um, made a you know, there's just the energy and then the pass rushing ability from the tackle spot is something you can't find very often. And when you have a chance to find a machine like that, you got to draft them. Yeah, the dude had. What the dude had seven and a half sacks this year and seven sacks last year from the defensive tackle spot. Like the fact that you're able to do that from the interior is very impressive. Yep. It'd really help out Micah Parsons a lot. Him and um Van Der Esch, uh that and DeMar you know, Dexter Lawrence on the edge. Now you now Dexter Lawrence is getting that one on one matchup on the edge. Parsons on the other. You're having to, you know, block down. You gotta find ways to you know to block somebody. Um, and it really puts pressure on that off on that, that offense to to put that scheme together to keep their quarterback upright. And it would be good for the Cowboys if they could find maybe a more traditional interior tackle to pair with him because he's going to want to get upfield, penetrate, be part of the pass rush. But I'm sure you're also going to have situations where you're just going to need an anchor in that D line, just hold down the middle. And I'm not sure he'd be the best for that, but I don't think that's what they'd be asking him to do. So. No, he's getting there. He's getting out. He's getting after the quarterback. All right, Kinger, we're going to you. It is the Buffalo Bills. Who do you got the Buffalo Bills at? Uh, Bills, you know, um, with with what they've got going on uh, and the talent pool left as far as round one here, I'm going to have to go full on Homer and go with my boy Maisie Smith out of Michigan. Um, he is a fantastic pass rusher. And if he, he's 6'3", 323, but if you haven't watched him, his reach, just physically, his reach is incredible. Uh, he's got the arm span. I, I don't – maybe it's just perception of me, but it looks like he's got arms that are twice as long as they should be. Uh, he's incredibly athletic, great pass rusher, but he's tremendous um, in interior line, close-in runs. He's just a great add, and I think that they could really use them – uh, to beefing up the defensive line. So, my boy, Mr. Smith, going. Interesting with pick there. Um, 
not getting Josh Allen some help and Stephon Diggs into the receiver there. But and in the defensive line, you're gonna have to go against the shutdown, and they they had struggled um, maintaining the line of scrimmage there late down the stretch. So solid pick either way. Yeah, I, I'm interested to see a guy like Smith because you know it, it, statistically he looks like a, a space eater in the middle of of a defensive line. It, like you said, six three, three hundred and thirty pounds. But the only thing that concerns me about him, the only red flag I have on on Maisie Smith is the fact that he only had a half a sack in his entire career at Michigan. And I just, again, when I'm making a first round pick, I want to have both for me. I want to have the the eye test. Does he, does he look the part? And then does the look in the athleticism match the production I see on the tape? Again, great in the middle of a defense, probably a great run eater, but I would love to have seen a little more production from the middle in stat and being able to sack the quarterback. So you call so him with space, him. a space heater. Can we call him a space heater if he gets drafted by the Bills? <laughs> well, with him, you know, I watched a lot of him being a Michigan fan, and his number one problem from my perspective is he is, for how good he is, awful at shedding blocks. When someone gets into him, he gets lost. It's when he's able to get into space or get right into wherever he needs to be that he's able to make things happen. So if he can work on that, might be able to turn it around, but he does have a, a big drawback there for sure. All right. Well, uh, I have the Cincinnati Bengals at number 28 here. Hi, Vey, folks. This was a tough one for me because I went and I started looking at I had Osiris Thomas. I was kind of hoping he would drop there at the 28, but didn't work out for me there. Uh, Brian Branch, I thought hopefully he'd be there. That didn't work out for me there. So who do I even take? Well, I'm going to go with Keely Ringo, cornerback from Georgia for the defending national title champion, Georgia Bulldogs. I know It depends on which Georgia fan you ask. Uh, I've heard fresh off air, absolutely hate Keely Ringo on one week. (laughs) And then I've also heard fresh off air talk about how amazing Keely Ringo is because, and again, I think this is just being a personal fan of your team. Certain weeks, certain players really tick you off and certain weeks they don't. I think he, he's an impressive, impressive cornerback. Two year starter over there in, in Georgia on the outside as well to be a multiple year starter on a defense that has been arguably one of the best in college football for an extended period of time and, and has had the consistency and has been able to prevent the pass as much as he has. I know a lot of people will look at, well, maybe that's a product of those people rushing the pass or a gain after the quarterback, but it also comes into play of, of the cornerbacks having to cover for, yeah, I might only have to cover for three three seconds, but that three seconds there are locked down. So I'm going Keely Ringo for the Cincinnati Bengals. And I will fully admit, yes, um, totally guilty on both accounts. Um, but there's times where I think, you know, Ringo was shut down Cedric Tillman. Ringo shut down um, Hyatt when he was man up one-on-one. Um, when he was in single coverage and the pass was there, he was able to play very tight on Marvin Harrison Jr. in the, the Peach Bowl. But the problem was, when the scramble drill started after, after well, what? Well, peach bowl. Yeah, you know, you're right. In, in the peach bowl. After the three second, four second, when Stroud broke out of the pocket and that play broke down, that's where he kind of lagged, where he's in that initial surge of the one, two, three, boom, he's okay. He's locked to the receiver. When your play breaks down, kind of gets a little lost in coverage. And also, I think there are times during the season because, you know, you can, he, he knew he could shut it down a little bit and not play 100%. So what Keely Ringo are you getting every single play because they have the size, the speed, the athletic ability is there, but what are you getting every single play? Because the NFL, you can't take plays off. Um, you're not beating somebody 63-7 to 7, um, or 65-7 to 7, or 70-12 to 12 or whatever. Um, you've got to be able to focus and line up every single play and, and play at the best of your ability. Absolutely. All right, we're going to New Orleans now. Drew, you got the Saints at 29. And let's just say if this draft goes the way it has for us, the Saints will not be happy because pretty much everything they need, all the best talent's been taken. So this will be the first time in my 
you know, GMing role here that I'm just going to take uh, not necessarily a need, um, but the New Orleans Saints are going to be drafting wide receiver Josh Downs from North Carolina. Um, Michael Thomas, I don't know if he'll ever play for the Saints again. Uh, it seems like he may. Um, I don't know what it'll be if he does. They did get Olave from Ohio State, who I think is pretty solid, whether on the slot or outside, but he's big enough to play outside, and I think you put Downs in the slot. Hopefully, you know, he can put on a little bit of size to compete with the NFL-sized defenders, but his footwork is great, and I think he's going to be able to get open, and I think it'll be good for uh, Derek Carr to have another weapon on the offense. Rush, I'll let you go with Downs there. I mean, I, I think Josh Downs is a fantastic receiver. going to be a great prospect. I have him highly ranked in my receiver rankings. Uh, what he did in North Carolina, he shows up and makes plays out of nothing. And you put him in that offense, you know, with Olave, with Michael Thomas, you have Derek Carr, quarterback, you know, Alvin Kamara there, running back. That's going to be a lot of space for defense to cover and let, lets him really get it, you know, to be able to get behind the safeties and make big plays. And like you mentioned about Michael Thomas, who knows? The guy really hasn't played in three years, maybe two and a half. Um, where's, his, where's his mind at? Where's his body at? You know, you've always got to – this is a, a show-me league, a current league, what you're doing now. And they're not going to keep paying Thomas if he's not going to play. Downs gives them two young receivers that they can really build an offense around Derek Carr with and be very explosive down there in New Orleans. Yeah, I'm a huge Josh Downs fan. Uh, I think he's the best receiver after the top three. I think, you know, with JSN, uh, Quinton Johnson, and Addison, I think those are the top three. There's a slight gap, but a gap. And then I think Josh Downs is is clearly the fourth wide receiver uh, there. I know Rice out of SMU, a lot of people are real high on him. And then um, Booty over in LSU. I, I struggle with him because of the production piece as well, but I think you're spot on there, Drew. I think that Josh Downs is, is a really, really good wide receiver. Yep. And, you know, I was between him and Zay Flowers out of Boston College yeah. and because mm. they kind of both could fit that same role, but I went with Downs. Um, I like – I think he would fit that role better, but also um, I just watched a lot more – Carolina games in Boston College so there's that familiarity there where I've seen this guy get open against good defenses and so I feel like it could translate absolutely yeah, I think both are special talents all right the Philadelphia Eagles have their second first round pick at number 30 King or who you got the Eagles taken to pair with Paris Johnson all right with Paris Johnson well uh not specifically for Paris per se but um, I've got two on the board still that may fit. One of them is Zay Flowers, but that's not ultimately who I think I would go with with what we've got left. I think I would actually um, go with a kind of a dual threat from Dalton Kincaid, tight end from Utah. Um, he is impressive to me. I have not watched him a ton. Uh, I've read some on him, and that what I did watch was uh, a real kind of double grab from him because he can – He's a great receiver, but he's a nasty blocker as well. Um, and, I mean, that's what you want in a tight end, obviously. And he can do both really well. It seems like from what I've gathered, he's great at both, and he doesn't really have a weakness on either. Um, I think that that's a, a good threat that you can use in a lot of different ways. So I think that would be the, the best uh, one-two punch for this pick. Kincaid and, Dal and Dallas Goddard would, be, would really give – that Eagle offense, a lot more weapons. You add in the two great receivers, you know, Jalen Hurts on the move, and any running back they want to fill in, that would be – it's already a very good offense. That would be a very, very destructive offense uh, for the for the Eagles. Yeah, I, I love Dalton Kincaid. He was a beast at Utah. You're looking at 35 touchdowns at his Utah career, and he was one of Cam Rising's favorite targets when they got in the red zone. Uh, I, again, fresh, we, we did watch a little bit of Utah this past year. I think we talked quite a bit about Kincaid. I, I think if, if Eagles walked away with him, I would, I would be very, very happy if I was an Eagles fan. 
Yep, and I think they would also make up for Miles Sanders leaving. But now you have more weapons in space. It makes those new running backs, whoever does, whoever that has become, more effective because there's so many other guys they have to be aware of. Yeah, they could they could really have their their choice of a pick here in in the second round. There are some pretty decent wa- running backs later in this draft here. All right, fresh. Last pick of the draft, the Super Bowl champions, Kansas City Chiefs. Fresh, who you got the Chiefs taking? There's a bunch of guys on the board here. Um, you can go offense and go defense. Or some, you know, but what does Andy Reid in, in that entire front office love to do is just find ways to be inventive on offense and open up holes and expose defense and whatever and give Patrick Mahomes a tons of toys. And there's a big, big toy still on the board. Um, Darnell Washington out of Georgia, pairing him with Travis Kelsey at tight end. Mixing the receivers in the crossing routes, he's, he's able to provide running, you know, run blocking at a pretty good level there on the offensive line. Allows his running backs to go. That offense will just take it to another level. Um, continue to maul people in the AFC and the NFL as a whole. I mean, I knew that that's who was who was coming there. Fresh, why would you take a, a tight end there? I mean, I'm going to guess this was almost a homer pick a little bit with the Georgia ties there. But why wouldn't you take a Oh, you already got, like you said, Travis Kelsey out there in um, in Kansas City. Why wouldn't you take maybe Rice out of SMU or maybe take like a speed guy like Jalen Hyatt? I'm not really set on Hyatt. I think um, I think he's a little bit farther down. But you look at the, the, the what Washington brings from the run blocking ability and the play action they like to run, crossing routes, but also the size and allows Kelsey to – be a little more exposed in different situations now. You can put Kelsey off the ball, keep him on the ball, and you're really creating matchup problems for linebackers and safeties on that opposing defense. They they don't care who the players are. They can move guys around. And Jalen Hyatt's very similar to Sky Moore. Um, why are you going to draft another guy that's very similar to you already have? Yes, they did lose J.J. Um, Smith-Schuster, uh, Juju Smith-Schuster, and they lost McCauley um, Hardman. But you just they just keep cycling guys through, and they built a solid good couple good running backs there in Pacheco. Is taking the lead, but that offense, they put guys down there and they create matchup problems all over the field. It doesn't matter how tall they are or how fast they are. They just find athletes. Um, I think Washington fits him in a good spot right there because he does help that offensive line. They did lose Orlando Brown Jr. I'm not sure Jawan Taylor should be the best blocker. So if you get into some of those run situations or even him chipping and playing a little backside protection a little bit just to help stall that pass rush, it gives you a little added um, fuel. And, you know, as, as amazing as Travis Kelsey's been, I don't think the guy's going to play until he's 40, and he takes a lot of hits. How can you keep moving those guys in and keeping his career being prolonged by having another tight end get playing time and adding that uh, career longevity? All right. Well, there was, there was our, our first round mock draft, all 31 picks right there. But before we go, any players that you guys want to say, like, while this person wasn't drafted, a player, maybe two that you were interested in, uh, that, you know, where the board fell, you, you didn't have to take them. I know we said uh, the kid out of Boston College, but I'll leave you to I'll leave everyone with maybe a player or two to kind of keep out. And if we are moving into the second round, yeah, I would say um, given the early run on it, I'm surprised that no one ended up taking Anton Harrison, the tackle out of Oklahoma. Um, you know, we had that run where. We went three tackles in a row, I think, and then just kind of stretch of teams that had other priorities. And so I think anybody, if he falls to the second round, I think that's a pretty good pickup. King, or anybody for you that maybe you were interested in? Yeah, I mean, I know Flowers was talked a lot, uh, talked about quite a bit there at the end. um, And he was on my list as a, a very real possibility. Um, and then there was one other player that, and, and this is kind of a out of nowhere pick, uh, and this is probably just more personal watching him, but um, Jaden Reed from Michigan State. Uh, he's not very high ranked, uh, but he was incredibly impressive uh, watching him play this year. Uh, I don't think it would be a reasonable pick as far as a general manager standpoint if I was in a power position or controlling one of the teams, but just my own watching him play um he seemed to have kind of a a talent that wasn't really represented in in 
talked about much. So if, if someone handed me the keys for the day and said, hey, you know, go with a wild ball pick, that would be someone I would consider because I think there's something to him. And for me, um, Emmanuel Forbes out of Mississippi State, cornerback, has a lot of skills, really probably a fringe there, late, late first round. Cam Smith out of South Carolina, another cornerback that could be a late first round, early second round player. And then Darnell Wright, um, the tackle from Tennessee, I think he's really surged up boards. And he can another fringe player that can make a run outside of Zay Flowers. But those those four all have potential to be you know first round picks that are laid on. And I think they all have great um, potential. Yeah. Mine was the cornerback out of Utah, Clark Phillips the third. I was high on him during the season. We talked a lot about him. It, again, I'm a huge production person. When they're producing well on the field, it, it's going to kind of go with me. But I really like Clark Phillips the third out of Utah. And then if going a later round pick, Israel Abaconda, I like him out of out of Pitt. Great running back, really performed well. So just a couple extra players. Gentlemen, I wanted to thank you all for joining us. This was fun. We'll do it again next year on the sec- on the, with the third mock draft, annual mock draft. <laughs> great time, <laughs> fellas. Great picks all around. That was great. All right, guys. So if you are watching this, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Subscribe to Spinnable Sports and the YouTube channel. And make sure you're visiting SpinnableSports.com all month long. Just like Fresh said, we're putting out mock draft articles. We have the top one. 105 in offense, top 105 in defense. We have draft cases, Anthony Richardson, Bajan Robinson, CJ Stroud, Michael Mayer is coming up there too. Fresh is dropping mock drafts as well. We're going to drop this episode. All sorts of draft content for you to get you ready for that last weekend in April. Make sure you're checking out all at spinablesports.com. Like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from, whether it's Apple, Spotify, Good Pods, Anything Pods. I don't know. You know I don't know them all. So subscribe. Leave us that five-star review because you know Fresh and I, we're those five-star prospects. Folks, make sure you're following us on Twitter. Interact with us. We're having a blast out over there. So check us out on social media. And with that all being said, it's been one year of doing these videos. You made the choice to watch them all with two guys with faces made for radio. We'll see you guys all later. (laughs) Bye, y'all.